Welcome everyone to the Retirement Power Hour podcast. My name is Joe Alaria. This is episode 15. As you can see, I'm going to be joined today by Jay Waters. This is part two of an episode that we're doing on the myths of retirement. Jay, good to have you back again. And I wanted to also remind the viewers, if you're watching on YouTube, if you are watching this video, uh, you're not seeing the full episode. If you want to hear the full episode, go to retirementpowerhourpodcast.com, go to Spotify, go to Apple. You can hear the entire episode where we include listener questions as well. But uh, this is the interview portion. So Jay, thanks again for coming back for part two of this exciting topic. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the continued discussion. I think there's a lot of good pits in here for everyone to listen here to and also just, you know, remind themselves of, you know, all the thing that goes into retirement. And there's a lot of myths out there that people hear but aren't really true. A lot of, a lot of myths, a lot of things that if you don't spend every day in this world like we do, it would be very easy to be led astray and to believe some of these things. So we are here to be the myth busters today and talk through these things further. The for, first myth for today, for this show, is about nursing care, long-term care. And one myth that I've heard is that, oh, that's covered by Medicare. Long-term nursing care is covered by Medicare, is, isn't it? Yeah, no, it, it, it's not covered. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people that do think that there's, oh, well, you know, Medicare, co- Medicare covers it. and Or my supplement. Or my supplement will cover it. And to a degree, it will cover some things. It depends on what led to it, how it happened. And there's certain days that Medicare will cover in, you know, hospital care. And there's certain days that yeah. Medicare, the Medicare supplement so, will cover X amount of days for yeah. hospital care. So De- depending when you depending how you enter the the nursing or assisted living facility, if it's if it's directly from uh, a medical event then uh, there's, a, there's a chance, best case, best case, Medicare could pay up to 20 days of your hospital stay or of your assisted living stay. And then if you have a supplement, best case, the supplement could pay up to 100 days of your care. Beyond that, now you're in true long-term care world where you're not getting Medicare, original Medicare, um, Medicare supplements, they're not paying for anything beyond 100 days. So a lot of people think when I get to retirement, my my medical costs are going to be a big cost for me. And I think that's a little bit misguided. And that could be another myth that we, you know, that we could have added right. in here. But people think I'm going to pay a lot in medical expenses. Well, the truth is, if you're on original Medicare, for example, you pay your Part B premium, you've got a supplement. Um, if you've got a more robust supplement, you may have a small deductible each year. And that's about it. Medicare is going to pay for, you know, as long as it's an approved Medicare expense, then Medicare essentially pays for for the rest. But where these big expenses come into play, historically could be prescriptions Um, that could that is changing a bit as we move forward. But another area is this long term care, these expenses for long term care and nursing care, which are incredibly expensive. Uh, facilities to stay in, depending on the level of care that you need. You know, you're talking 5,000, 7,000, 9,000 a month, depending on the different levels of care that you may need. That adds up very, very quickly. So yeah. it's not covered by Medicare. That's a myth. We, uh, we did an episode, episode eight, I believe, where we talked more about Medicare and some of these things. So go back and listen to that. You can get that on Spotify, retirementpowerhourpodcast.com, a few different places. The next myth, Jay, kind of back to the investing front for for this, for part two here in this episode, but you can count on historical returns to repeat during your retirement. Yeah. Well, one quick thing I was just thinking about, Joe, is, you know, speaking related to Medicare, and we didn't even have this on, on our topic of discussion, but just thinking of it as... The other myth around Medicare or insurance costs is, oh, I can't retire until I'm 65 because the health insurance cost is just going to eat me to death, right? The health True. insurance cost is is overwhelming. So I have to either work until 65 or have a spouse work till 65 because right. the health insurance is just going to be too much until I go on to Medicare. 
Yeah. So again, didn't even have it on there, but it just made me start to think because I know yeah. I hear that a lot. And I yeah, know a lot of absolutely. people say, you know, I am 63, but I got to go two more years because the health insurance. A hundred percent. And it's again, it's that may be the case for some people depending on income, but you know, we've seen time and time again, and we help clients with it is you can get affordable health insurance yes. with a decent deductible and max out of pocket yes. to where that can fit into the retirement plan and you can retire before 65. Correct. So again, lot don't of, let that hold you up from retiring. Just a lot of pitfalls you. in that, you know, yep. so you, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing yeah. or better yet contact someone that knows what they're doing that can help you. But there are a lot of pitfalls in that whole pre 65 transition to Medicare. I mean, so many different things. One of the biggest questions is, do I need to enroll in Medicare when you turn 65? So that's a, that's an entire show in itself. Right. We did a show on just general Medicare. We could do an entire show on when do I sign up for Medicare? Yeah. Um, Cause there's a and B, but yeah, just on a, you know, high level view right, is right. again, yeah, for, you know, cause we're doing myths of retirement. You don't have to be 65 to retire yeah. just to be able to get on Medicare. Good so. one. So yeah, now, anyways, now we're getting historical into, returns. <laughs> now, we're, yeah, now we're into historical returns and you can count on them to repeat historical returns to repeat during retirement. In other words, well, a 60, 40 average, I'm, I'm going to throw out a random number, a hypothetical here, but if a 60, 40 average 7% over the last 30 years, it's going to average 7% over the next 30 years, right? Yeah. So never attempt to, or assume repeatable returns. Now it does help, you know, we were just talking about it too, was having a diversified portfolio does help that. Mm -hmm. But if you look at just the S&P 500, right, there, there's been the lost decade, but then there was also the 10 years after that, that were very, very good. Explain what the lost decade is, if you can. Yeah. So S&P 500 from, what was the time frame? 2000, 2000 to 2009. Yep. Was the S&P was basically flat over those yeah. 19 Cum years. Cumulative at the end of 2009 was actually negative. The returns were negative. Now you could yeah. say, well, that was because of the that global financial board. crisis. Right. Yeah. But it was still negative over a 10 year period of time. Yep. So yeah, being diversified helps reduce helps that. Reduce but that again, risk. you would never want to say, well, the S and P was negative for those nine years. So it's going to be negative the next oh, yeah. you know, 10 years. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And in the um, same way, the, the next 10 years after that, that S and P had an incredible run and yeah. you, you wouldn't want to count on that. I think the mistake here that we're driving at is when you go and do a retirement plan or someone goes on and does a retirement calculator and tries to figure out, are they on track? I think the mistake is, just looking at historical returns and plugging in that number for and just using that number assume I mean, there's, yeah you're assuming there's a lot of times return. where <clears throat> clients want to see a lower than average rate of return just so then if we actually do get that number or the market produces that number <clears throat> we've already accounted for it yeah on the projection yeah on, on, the, the, projection. on, the, on the projection no, yeah we always want to see higher than average returns but yeah. on the projection um, and we sometimes we have to you know explain that why we're using lower than average returns on on the projection because we are trying to project a less than ideal scenario going forward and we're also measuring the environment and so interest rates it's a very interesting conversation yet again on interest rates but rewind about a year ago interest rates and two years ago and three years ago were they were incredibly low. And so when you looked at bond return expectations with those incredibly low interest rates, the, the expectations were, very, were low. They were not equal to the bond returns from 1980 to 2020, where, where bonds actually did pretty darn well for being bonds during that time, because the 10 year treasury note in 1982, I think it was, went from about 15% and then over the course of time down to what, 0.5% uh, in 2020. So when interest rates drop, bond prices go up, bonds do better. Well, okay, now let's look at starting at 2020 where interest rates are 
at a at a essentially a bottom. How are bonds going to do now as rates go up? Now, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and uh, we can look at this now and say, well, geez, bond we you know bonds shouldn't have been in any portfolio as of the end of twenty twenty, but no one could exactly foresee the level of aggression that the Fed was going to take in 2022 to raise raise rates the way they did. So when rate when rates go up at slower paces, it doesn't have the same sort of negative effect. But when there's a sharp increase, it causes bond prices to go down. And that's what we've seen this year. What's the silver lining there, Jay? Now interest rates are up. So bonds are paying out higher yields you know, they're paying out higher levels of income. And over time, now that's that speaks to better longer term returns in those bond investments. But it may take a while yeah. for those bonds to recover because they've Everyone, taken such a hit this year. Everyone always says, you know, are higher interest rates a good thing? And I always say, well, it depends on if you're a borrower or a saver. <laughs> it depends. Yep. And yeah. if you own right bonds, now, if you're a saver, you're, yeah. Yeah. Bonds will yield or should yield a high percent. Yeah. Are you a lender or are you a borrower? Yeah. When you own right. bonds, you're lending money. So higher rates are, are good. Now, if you're, if you're borrowing money, it does make it a lot more difficult, you know, to go get a mortgage, car payment, whatever it may be. You, get, you think differently about it when rates are where they are today. The next one, Jay, another, a different category going a different direction, but a, but a big myth is, I'm only going to live to 80. I'm only going to live to 85. Or in other words, I'm not going to live to 90. I'm not going to live to 95. I'm definitely not going to live to 100. But what have you seen? What What do you share with clients on that topic? Well, when we when I show clients or prospective clients, okay, what is the scenarios that we're running or what's our baseline scenario is we always like to run everything to at least age 100. And, you know, most people think it can it can go either way is living to 100 or living for a longer time will either stress your portfolio more depending on withdrawals or it could be a good thing living a longer time because more you have more time for your money to compound but for the most part the longer you live the more stress it is on your portfolio because there's longer amount of time for withdrawals so you would never want to be in the assumption of Hey, I have to die at 80 to not run out of money. We'd rather be in a scenario of, well, yes, I family history, I may only live till then, but I'd rather make sure that I'm good until 100 just in case I do live to 81, 82, 83. Um, Because you never want to have to say I have to die by a certain age to make sure I don't run out of money. Yeah, absolutely. It's better to overestimate your life expectancy. And it sounds morbid, but if you... You know, if you die prematurely, not great from a life expectancy standpoint, but financially, you you didn't run out of money. It's it's not the worst case scenario financially. It might be a bad case scenario, worst case scenario, measuring everything else. But finan- financially, everything's upside down. If I don't live a long time, that's actually good for my retirement. If I do live a long time, that's a big drain on my retirement. And so... You know, it's it's a it's a bit morbid to think about, but it it happens, I think, much more often than people think. And I, I see this happening with parents of our existing clients who may be in their 60s or you know in their 50s, and their parents are living to 90, 95, nearing a hundred. If you look at the statistics on it, I've got a study here that we found on CBS News. And it says the odds are, are about 31% that one member of a 65-year-old couple will live to 95. One out of every three 65-year-old couples, someone's going to live to 95. And that's a risk. That is, that is a financial risk that we'll kind of talk about. It kind of segues into the next topic a little bit. But it is a risk that needs to be addressed. Now, I don't mean addressing that by cutting your life expectancy short. Um, Live a long life. Live a great, happy life. Have a high quality of life. Do everything in your power to do that. We strongly believe in that. 
but it needs to be addressed financially. And I think it's a mistake for people to, to just put their head in the sand and say, ah, I'm never going to live that long. And, and you're not, and don't plan for it. Like, ah, just Jay, just put me at 80. There's no way I'm living to 81. I, I think that would be a mistake to do a plan that way. Yep. I agree. Well, the next one is sort of on that line and it's, you need an annuity if you are retired or if you're going to retire, you need an annuity. Meaning, you know, you, you hear a lot about annuities out there. Again, on the radio, we talked last episode. If you turn on talk radio on a Saturday or really any day of the week, you're going to hear a show. You're going to hear someone talking about how uh, you shouldn't be in the market, how you can't afford for the market to go down. If you're 65, if you're retired, the, the, the market environment is terrible and you can't sustain those losses. So in order to avoid the market, you need to jump into these safe products. You get, you know, they'll say you get the upside of the market, but there's no downside risk. You get life guaranteed lifetime income. Some of those things are true. You can get guaranteed lifetime income, but I have a real problem with the way that folks try to sell these on the radio and, and really give the impression that they're these great growth vehicles and they have no downside risk. Well, that doesn't happen. The old adage, if it sounds too good to be true, it, it probably is. And that is the case. But as far as income goes, Jay, I think that's what we're talking about. Do you need an annuity that is going to provide guaranteed lifetime income if you are retired? We know you don't need every kind of annuity because there's a ton right. of them out there that that we don't like that have high fees. They're very complex. But do you need even the good kind? Does everyone need a good annuity to provide lifetime income when they retire. No, I mean, <clears throat> every scenario is different, but do you need one? No. Why and wouldn't you, why would someone not need an annuity? This kind of goes back to the, the living expenses, the living style, right? Is again, just as a scenario, let's say you do have 500 grand and you need a small withdrawal rate to mm -hmm. meet your lifestyle expenses. Cause you already have social security and you have no debts and you just live below your means. Yeah. Then from a, what you need as a guaranteed rate of return standpoint, it wouldn't make sense to put all the money in an annuity or need that annuity to make sure that you can meet those lifestyle expenses. You can simply do it through just proper bucketing methods. Yeah. Now, instead of saying, why wouldn't someone need an annuity? Why wouldn't someone need more, more guaranteed income? The thing that comes to my mind is because they already have enough, more than enough guaranteed income. Yeah. Again, and we, we do see clients all the time that have pensions. Maybe they're military pensions. Maybe they're government pensions. Um, teachers have that have great pensions and they already have more than enough guaranteed income okay. coming in yep. and portfolios on top of that. So if I need three thousand dollars a month or let's just say it's a married couple. I need $6,000 a month, but between all you know, two social security benefits and a pension, I have $7,000 a month coming in. Do I need to take any of my portfolio and go buy an annuity that's going to generate more guaranteed income? I already have more than I need. Do I need to go get more income? Obviously not. That, that would be a situation where the answer is a, is a resounding no, but do some people need an annuity? Well, there's different trains of thought there. You can certainly do that if, let's say, you don't have any guaranteed income. Let's say you have a million dollars and and just Social Security, and and Social Security is not going to cut it to meet all of your needs, and you want more guaranteed lifetime income. You certainly could use an annuity, and in some cases, it does make sense if you get the right kind that are low cost, simple, um, and that you understand all the benefits. But a lot of people choose to not purchase an annuity because like you said, Jay, they just, they use a portfolio of stocks, bonds, they use that bucketing strategy, they buy into that and they believe that if I just take the risk myself in the market, I'm likely to do better long-term because annuity companies don't have this magic investment, you know, realm to, to dive into that other people don't have access to. I mean, they're, for the most part, turning around, investing in very similar things that, that we can invest in. But here's the difference. They do have the benefit of pooling, pooling their, their investments and pooling their obligations. So 
if they guarantee Jay to pay you for for life, you may live a long time, but you may not. And so they're making a return on people that don't live a long time. Right. And they're using part of that return to pay for people that do live a long time. And they've got actuaries to figure out how all of this works at a large scale. The, you know, the, the law of large numbers, like they, they can see patterns, they can figure this stuff out, but they're taking a little bit of risk and the, and you are getting that risk off of your table, off of your plate. But sometimes people say, I'm okay taking that risk. I'm going to, I'm going to take that risk myself. I don't want to pay someone basically to take the risk for me. I'll take the risk myself. And sometimes I think I would agree with those people that you may be able to do better doing it yourself rather than trying to outsource that risk and pay it an insurance company to take it for you. Yeah. There's a, again, every, every scenario is different, but like you said, sometimes it, if you don't have any guaranteed income outside social security, then it may make sense to do a little bit. Or again, you may say, you know what, I'm willing to bear the risk. I'm okay watching my money go up and down yeah. going in the long run. I, I may come out ahead or should come out ahead. Right. And a lot of it boils down to just what can your emotions handle? Right. Maybe you don't want to have the whole amount on the roller coaster ride. Maybe you do want to outsource some sure. of it and say, I will bear some of the risk and I'll let the insurance company bear some of the risk. Yeah. Uh, every scenario is different. Everyone's risk tolerance is different. Um, but do you need, does everyone need an annuity? No. I guess that's where I have my problem is I, I hear again, the, the radio shows the people out, you know, some quote advisors that are pushing that message. You got to have an annuity. Everyone that's retired, you got to have an annuity. You got to have this type of lifetime guaranteed income. And I'm, I think that we are about balance. We are about using the right tool. You referenced that on the previous episode, I believe, but the right tool for the job. And we don't need to use a hammer for everything. Screw something in, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to use a hammer to screw something in. You know, it, can it get the job done? Maybe, but it's probably not going to be the best way to do it. Um, there's a better way. There's a more efficient way. And I think balance is so important when we look at all the tools we can use. You can't say annuities are bad. I cannot. I mean, someone could say that, but if they said that, I don't think they're being honest. Just like if someone says stocks and bonds are bad, th that person's not being honest. It's not that all stocks and bonds are bad. Uh, I see videos on social media, Jay, all the time, not to derail too much here, but I see these, you know, whether they're on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, I, I see videos that people are just there. They'll bash 401ks. They'll bash the stock market and, and whatever they're bashing, it's always there's always something tied to that. I'm going to bash 401ks to push so that I can else. so that I can get you in my real estate investing program. Right. And you can pay me a large fee to consult or I'm going to bash the market because I sell indexed universal life policies and I made up a name for them and I called them a Roth IUL, you know, which is, these this are real things. I mean, I, I see these things. It just boggles my mind. The stuff that people say that really, I don't think is compliant. I don't think that that professionals are allowed to Use or say the th things that are being said, but these people are saying them, people see the videos, they get tons of follows. And because you have, I think a lot of regular good advisors who are restricted on what platform they can go on. You know, a lot of advisors, you can't go on TikTok. The TikTok's not approved. And they're restricted in some of the things that, that we can say or talk about because there are rules in our industry. And, and some of these people are just blatantly go outside of that. And they, they use these sales tactics and they try to, you know, they tell you something is bad when it's, you can't make a blanket statement about anything, but every tool has its use, its best use. And having balance and understanding when to use each tool is what we recommend. Okay, last one here. I've, I've got one more, Jay, and it's retirement planning is all about money. And I threw this one in here just because, is it something I hear I don't hear this outwardly, but I observe it in my interactions with clients. I don't hear them say 
retirement planning is all about money. But yet when we sit down to plan for retirement, I observe that the conversations a lot of times stay on money. I know a lot of advisors, their conversations stay on money. They start on money and they end on money. And retirement planning is about much more than that. And I'm yeah. sure you would agree with that. Yeah, I completely agree. And you see it. I've seen a lot more and more recently where there's not just the financial side of retiring. There's the emotional side of retiring yep. and it's, you know, what am I going to do once I retire? So right. there's many of clients that we meet with and have that are financially set where we don't need to talk about money, money, money. It might be right. It starts with money, but then it ends with, okay, what's the lifestyle sure. I want to live in retirement? What is, how do I make that transition from being important, being relevant, going and doing something every day and having meaning in the corporate world or in your own business or whatever it may be to, yep. okay, now what do I do every day? And yep. that is the biggest transition in and of its own because yeah. again, it's now what do I do with my day? Right. <laughs> and it's so important to have hobbies or uh, another passion project or whatever it may be. Yeah. Once you do go to retire, have a plan. Yep. Think about it. And obviously we're going to talk about money because I think money, it's, it's that first layer of retirement success, I'll call it, but it's just survival. And you, you have to be able to check that off the box. You have to check that box, check yep. that off your list. Can I survive? Can I pay for my essential needs? And so we have to talk about that because money is going to drive that. And you should talk about that, but it, I don't think it should stop there. And I think it does a lot of times. And I think only sometimes do people go to the second level of this retirement success pyramid, which might be the survival plus where it's okay. I can survive and maybe I can take a trip a year. Maybe we can do a few things, you know, enjoy some of our hobbies and, and, and then we're good. You know, we are content, but there's a third, I think there's a third level of retirement success. And that is retirement fulfillment. You know, if it's, it's like the, the top of, I can't remember the, what, what pyramid it was, but it's that self actualization. But I, I say the retirement success pyramid, the top is, is true fulfillment in retirement. That's when you you've gotten over the survival hump. You've been able to do some of the hobbies that you like, you, you know, you do those things that you enjoy yourself but you think even further outside of the box and you plan for what is going to provide me the most fulfillment while I'm retired. And you take actionable steps toward that. Maybe it's gifting to your children. Maybe it's uh, charitable donations. Maybe it's volunteering things that you do that if you lay your head down at the end of the day and you spend all day doing those things, you say to yourself, man, what a great day. What a great day that I just had, because if you do that every day in retirement, you're going to lay your head down at the end of retirement and say, what a great retirement. What a great way that I just spent the last 30 years. And on the flip side, if you don't do it, you lay your head down at the end of retirement and say, gosh, I, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. And uh, none of us are guaranteed any amount of time. And so best to not only plan for the financial part, but for that lifestyle part too. Fun conversations we get to have too with folks that buy into that and you know, we get to help them along that journey. Well, th this was fun, Jay, talking about some myths, being myth busters, always <laughs> good. We, I, I know I speak for you as well too, but I'm, I'm super passionate about getting people on the right track and, yep. and educating them and clearing up misinformation. And yeah, that, given, that's something, given that's something I enjoy. That, that clarity, that soundboard, yeah. and just that guiding light that, because there's so many, like you said, disinformation out there, just bad information out there yep. that is intended to scare you, intended to make you doubt, make you question yes. when you know, that's completely unnecessary. The, whether it's the media, yep. other quote financial professionals, your neighbor, your family member who's, you know, spouting whatever they heard from those sources. There's a lot of 
a lot of uh, opportunities to fear to have excess stress. So, you know, a good time to mention too, if you've listened to some of what we've talked about and you've wondered about your own situation and you and you're wondering, are you on track or have you been getting the best advice? I would encourage you. You can get a, a free retirement analysis by going to retirementpowerhourpodcast.com, click work with me, fill out the information to schedule a 30 minute phone call. And the first step is going to be me talking to you, asking you a few questions, gathering some information, getting a sense of where you are and explaining to you the process that we can take to get you that retirement assessment. And I already mentioned it, it is something that we do. It is complimentary. It's free. So go to retirementpowerhourpodcast.com and click that work with me tab to start the process to get your free retirement analysis. No reason to wait. Do it now. And uh, we look forward to helping everyone that does to clear up some of the myths maybe that you've heard as well. And Jay, on that topic of misinformation, you may recall, I'm sure you do. You were on the inaugural episode Oh, of yeah. the Retirement Power Hour podcast, where we do this every single year. I've, I've done this in webinar format in the past, but at the, at the beginning of every year, we look back at what happened during the year and we compare that to the predictions that the so-called financial experts made about that year at, at the beginning of the year. So I'm very excited to do that in a couple of months and hopefully it can have you back on the show to join me and, and talk about that and, and kind of beat up on these people that continue to spread misinformation um, because someone's got to do it and someone's got to put out the right information. So hopefully you can come back for that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for listening. Again, go to retirementpowerhourpodcast.com for all of our past episodes. You can also submit a listener question on there. We'll read it on the show. If you want the full episode of this podcast, you have to go to Spotify, Apple, or you can go to the website, retirementpowerhourpodcast.com. This is just the uh, interview portion if you are watching this video. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. With that, again, I'm Joe Alaria. This is the Retirement Power Hour, where we help people invest wiser and retire better. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Power Hour podcast. All material discussed on this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be construed as individual tax, legal, or investment advice. Investing involves risk of loss, and investors should be prepared to bear potential losses. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Joe Alaria is an investment advisor representative of Carson Alaria Wealth Management, a registered investment advisory firm. Information discussed on this podcast may be derived from third parties that are believed to be reliable, but Carson Alaria Wealth Management does not control or guarantee the accuracy or timeliness of such information and disclaims all liability for damages resulting from such sources. Any references to third parties are provided as a convenience and do not constitute an endorsement.